everything went into slow motion. And I knew instantly when my left foot touched the ground that it wasn't right. He was very calm in a situation where he could have had every right uh, to lose his composure, lose his bearing, but he stayed professional throughout the whole ordeal, even as he was coming in and out of consciousness. It's not a friendship, it's a brotherhood, and that's something that you endure together. And we have become family. Pete, Nick, and I, the three of us, have become very close. What is it that drives people to be brave? To commit acts of heroism, often in the face of the enemy. I'm Darren Coventry, former soldier and now video and podcast producer at BFBS. I've been talking to men and women who've received the UK's highest military honours. We talk about what happened, what they thought at the time, and how they feel about it now. This is Tea and Medals. Major Pete Norton, of, uh, formerly of the Royal Logistics Corps and recipient of the George Cross. Um, thanks for coming. It's a real honour to meet you. Well, thanks for inviting me along. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the most important question, um, regardless of everything else, is how do you take your broom? Oh, definitely a Julie Andrews. White nun, please. <laughs> <laughs> we need a kind of a chart, I think, of how everyone takes it. Maybe it needs to appear in the in the video somewhere. Um, so Pete, you um, served in the army and in a job that some people might understand and, and know as a bomb disposal, um, but your official title would have been an ammunition technician and then later as a, a ammunition technical officer, ATO. Yep. Um, so tell us, tell us about that, tell us about your, your job. It was a bit weird because it was never really meant to be, it had never been my intention. Uh, I'd always wanted actually to, to join the Air Force as a, a pilot, um, but uh, unfortunately a family doctor at some point in my childhood had written that I'd got asthma. Um, and as there were no recruiting issues at all at that point, uh, all they did was take one look at that on the, on the documents and wouldn't even consider me for any further. Um, so that was a, a sort of a, a bit of kick in the teeth, um, sit back and, and think about what one wants to do. Uh, I ended up leaving uh, partway through my A-levels at school because I wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't uh, really firing all of my rockets, as it were. So uh, after a little period working in Civvy Street, uh, I decided to join the army. Um, my brother had been in for a little while and he was enjoying it. So initially I applied for a commission in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps and went to Blackdown Barracks in January 83 uh, as a potential officer cadet to do a three month potential officer cadet course. Uh, that was fantastic fun. Uh, really put through the mill for three months, lots of fizz, lots of leadership tasks, lots of high stress uh, situations to be put into, constantly being assessed. Uh, and then went forward to regular commissions board at Westbury. Um, they took a look at me there and unfortunately turned around and said, we think you've got something, but go away and finish your A-levels. Uh, well, I'd already taken that decision. I didn't want to do the A-levels. Uh, myself, along with a couple of other guys that had done the POC course with me and got the same sort of knockback deferral, uh, all three of us decided that we'd enjoyed the three months so much we were going to join up as soldiers. Um, so the Ordnance Corps offered us the trade of ammunition technician. It was the only one that they really wanted us to go into because of the educational requirements and the fact that it gave us the most money. It was a technical trade. Um, so we all signed up for that and uh, after uh, doing full another three months of proper basic training to become qualified soldiers, we then went on to our trade training uh, and passed out as ammunition technicians class two. Pete completed his training and left as a Lance Corporal. He was posted to 5 Ordnance Battalion in Germany, where he ended up working at 5-2 Ordnance Company. Postings followed for Pete in the normal army fashion at the time moving every few years between Northern Ireland and Germany. By 1986, he was the senior ammunition technician responsible for bomb disposal in Northern Ireland. Eventually, he reached the rank of W01 conductor, at the time, one of the most senior soldier appointments in the British Army, and a real testament to his knowledge and experience. Pete then commissioned and took up an appointment as a captain at RAF Witten in Cambridgeshire, looking after ground-to-air weapon systems. 
but he soon found his way back to the army. I actually got pulled out of Witten a year early. Um, there was a, a manning issue in the 11 EOD regiment, so I got pulled back into 11 EOD and went to Ashchurch, which was the headquarters of 71 EOD squadron, uh, and assumed the role of 2IC of the squadron there. Um, had to sub in there as the OC for six months initially on arrival because the OC had to deploy on something else. Um, but then it was pretty uh, obvious that soon I was going to get pulled out to go and support an operation either in Afghanistan, which was looming, or as was more likely and as it turned out, uh, to support operations in Iraq. You were uh, you know, at Ashchurch and then you deploy to Iraq? Yep. So you had to be a late entry mm -hmm. captain. So an, I mean, that's because of your experience. Yeah, and so you bring Northern all that Ireland. experience with you, both from Northern Ireland and, our, and having sort of come up through the ranks and done weapons in before. Yeah. Uh, to, to assist them and guide them in setting up uh, and running this unit. And the Americans are, are very good at this. You know, they, they bring all the, the manpower and the money to the party. In this instance, we bring the experience, but then very soon they learn from you and they just start running away with yeah. it and bringing in more money and making it much bigger than we could ever it could. It sounds like Afghanistan and Iraq. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so, so essentially it's the same sort of things we used to do in Northern Ireland with our bomb intelligence team, which then became weapons intelligence teams and yeah. weapon intelligence company. And it's basically to find out what is the enemy doing, how are they doing it, what they're using, who are they. And it's, it's a combination of technical and biometric intelligence that helps you identify and hopefully defeat the enemy. Yeah, so it's real like intelligence at the cutting edge of yeah. operations. You know, yeah. It's really affecting every aspect of our almost how vehicles are built, how uh, how troops move around and... It's all done by a very diverse team that's brought together, you know, that so that whole sexy unit. As I say, you know, you've got US Navy personnel, you've got US Army personnel, you've got British Army personnel, some Australian Army personnel, you've got civilians from uh, USA, various US agencies, you've got FBI guys there, all working together to get that same job done. Yeah. And it's two of those FBI guys who are an important part of this story. My name is Nicholas Boshears, and I'm a supervisory special agent with the FBI. And I've been with the FBI since 1999. In 2005, I was a line special agent uh, bomb technician and was assigned to the Boston field office. And I was deployed to Iraq in support of the Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. Uh, and essentially was assigned there for about three months. My name is Christopher Rogopoulos. I'm an FBI a supervisory special agent bomb technician. Uh, I work in the explosives unit in the FBI laboratory. Uh, I've been an agent uh, since 1997, so, you know, a pretty full career there. Pete met Nick and Chris, who is also known as Rigo, when he joined the Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. Sexy. All right, C-E-X-C. -E Yes, you put that together, it's sexy, right? And literally they were calling, you know, the guys, well, they said the sexy guys are here and we couldn't shake it. So we had to own it. So we actually embraced it and that became our, our thing. It is what it is. So our primary mission uh, at that time was in working with our coalition partners, uh, specifically United Kingdom, uh, as well as Australia. We were present uh, to conduct post-blast investigations uh, to determine when there was a complex attack or the potential use of uh, sophisticated improvised explosive devices, our role was to conduct a essentially a preliminary on-scene investigation, uh, not only to gather facts or gather evidence, but also to kind of do an examination of the tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, in order to try to keep our forces safe and at the same time, attempt in every way possible, forensically uh, and investigatively, to determine who the individuals were that were actually building those devices. And through that type of work, uh, continual exposure to the trends in the movement of TTPs, we would hopefully uh, get information and, and have opinions we could present back to uh, the, the, the armed forces and give them an idea of what's happening so they could adjust their tactics as well to prevent more uh, attacks and save lives and just kind of be in front of it. So the, the unit itself depended really what was going on. In some cases, most of the unit might deploy in two Humvees, um, which would typically be about 10 people deploying at a go. But actually on a day-to-day -day basis, we developed this sort of system where actually we might just deploy as a team of five 
in one vehicle so that you're not constantly all going out and, and because it's, it's literally day on every time maybe four or five times a day in some cases occasional quiet days but most days were quite busy we're here to talk about your george cross but i think it's worth talking about some of the other stuff that happened on that tour before we get to that because it was as you say it was a very hectic busy tour well day one was a great example um, literally sort of got off the hook um, was met by the guy that i was replacing taken back uh, and within half an hour, basically I unpacked my kit, got my assault vest all ready to go and everything's rock and rolling. And half an hour later, we're out. And in, in the first two days, I think it was five car bombs and suicide bombs and the like that we deployed to. Yeah. And that was that was it. That was straight in to the job. Um, and Baptism it continued. Of fire? Is that pretty funny? much, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there were a number of occasions where either myself and my team or the other team were out there and you know you get car bombs going off quite close or the brpgs fired into your area yeah and baghdad was a real wild west it, it at that was time, pretty yeah, you know? yeah one incident that i did read about was a, about a, a suicide vest that you were looking at so all the local eod teams would send in their stuff that they'd rendered safe so that it could then be exploited and a lot of the exploitation was uh, if it wasn't something particularly uh, high threat or, or high uh, priority at the time, then we'd have a quick look at it and, and triage it. And if it was safe, etc., then it would actually get boxed up, sent back to the UK or US for the, the full exploitation. Yeah. Um, but of course, that triage thing, that was also part, my, major part of my daily job when I was not deployed out on the ground, was triaging the stuff that came through. Uh, and I got to at the bottom of, of this box that had turned up, and there was this sort of fairly standard sort of looking suicide vest, a lot of American C4, which had obviously been captured or, or found stolen from somewhere. Loads of ball bearings on the front, and then I found out it was about seven detonators still inside of it. They hadn't been removed or anything. It's like, I probably ought to do something about this. See, I imagine this now is, you know, cameras rolling Hollywood movie stuff. It's like, better sort this out. No, it was, it was, it was um, better sort this out. Uh, so I took some photos before I took it apart and then just started cutting it open with a scalpel and, and getting them out, basically just to reduce the danger. Because it was literally in our triage area next yeah. to the office. And, yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, from what I've, what I've heard about you and talked to some of your friends as we'll discuss, you know, that kind of epitomizes your, your, your cool, cool nature. <laughs> By the sounds of it. I think Were it you cool? I think it annoys my wife sometimes. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, have you ever seen uh, The Bridge of Spies with yeah. Tom yeah. Hanks uh, and the, the Russian spy that gets caught? And uh, a number of times during the film, he out turns around and says, Are you not worried? And the response is, Would it help? No. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, it's a really good way to look at it. But that gets us on to the 24th of July, and you were working with your team at Sexy, and you got called to a serious incident which involved a unit from the 121st Georgia National Guard, um, which I'm assuming is quite a routine shout for you guys. Well, yeah, this was a, a classic one. So the, the Sunday, it was actually a fairly quiet day up until that point. Um, and I, I think it was late afternoon when the, f the first call came through. Um, so we just had to get the team together uh, and we did the same sort of Again, just deployed as a small team. So in this case, one vehicle, uh, five of us in it. So there was myself, there was Nick Boshears, who was FBI, uh, Chris Rogopoulos, FBI, uh, Ken Chisholm, who's ATF, uh, Andrew Martin, who was Australian Army. And so at the time, if you can picture, uh, obviously a very dusty environment uh, where often you couldn't see, but a few meters ahead of you. Uh, temperature was in excess of 50 degrees C. And, you know, you're wearing about 25 to 30 kilos of kit and uh, cramped into armored vehicles and essentially going outside the protection of the base uh, to conduct our job. And so we did that obviously with the support of the military to ensure that we were safe and that we were able to get our job completed as quickly as possible. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a high threat environment. Uh, we were going to places where attacks had just taken place, where it had taken place very recently. So we were constantly under the threat of uh, potentially taking hostile fire or what we would consider follow-on devices. Um, so we drove basically, as I said, about 15 minutes without leaving camp just to get to 48 Brigade Combat Team's uh, op center. Got a, a briefing in there as to what was happening. And ideally, really, would have 
like to have deployed onto the ground straight away. Still daylight, uh, always good to get out on the ground in daylight so you can see what's going on. But you've also got to sort of work with the unit who are trying to control what for them is obviously quite a traumatic yeah, time. I suppose time. there's a lot going on, yeah. a lot of different uh, moving parts. And they wanted to get um, recovery section out there because they'd got, you know, basically the remains of a vehicle and a load of other equipment and body parts and all that which needed recovery. So instead of us just going out there with our American MP escort that we normally had, we were sat around for quite a while actually waiting for this recovery team to be able to join us and go out as a convoy to the scene. So by the time we got to the scene, uh, it was early evening and it, was, it had already got dark, uh, which is never ideal, but you, you know it is what it is, you've got to do uh, the job. Uh, so it's about probably about 6k southwest of Biap, um, so not, not, not that far out of Camp Victory really. But it's a very flat, open, rural area, a lot of agriculture going on, a uh, lot of big irrigation ditches traversing that whole area. Uh, and as uh, the incident was on this one long road that runs east to west, and basically earlier that day uh, they'd had a, a vehicular patrol going along there, uh, and I think it was second or third off the top of memory, I'm not certain. Uh, Humvee got hit by this massive buried IED. Um, whether it was Command Wire or RCID, I, I don't know. Uh, and it just destroyed the Humvee. Uh, largest part that was left really was the engine block um, with the, the front sort of axle attached. Uh, the rest of it, the equipment, and unfortunately the, the occupants were just spread for 50 meters all over the place. So when we arrived, the, the unit had already been on the ground for quite some time, obviously yeah. they're trying to secure the routes in, make sure nobody can get in and out. As I say, very wide open area, they're open to attack. They yeah, could so have they're been, under threat. Yeah, they're under threat constantly. Threat could have well. been indirect mortar fire, mm -hmm. roof like rockets, could have been a suicide vehicle bomb, IED and all driven. these things happened all the time. So they're this happening is what, constantly, every day, yeah. every, everything you go to. You, you, so the soldiers are really on edge. Yeah. They know. And at the same time, they're, they're on edge, but we know that we've got to get the job done as quickly as possible to get them out of the way so they're not under threat. And they've already been there for quite a long time. Uh, so we, we turn up, uh, we, we stop short um, where we can see the guys at the side of the road and do our fives and 25s straight away. So uh, for those that are not aware, five, fives and 25, five metre check. Uh, first thing you do when you stop out on operations in that sort of, sort of threat area is five minute look before you even get out. You're looking out the windows. Is there anything around here I should be suspicious of? It doesn't matter that a unit's already there. You do it all the time, every time, so that it becomes second nature. You don't want to be in a situation where the guys are wondering if this is a job where I should do a check or shouldn't do a check. You just do it automatically. The fives and twenties have actually made their way into military. Yeah, well, it used yeah. to be fives and twenties. Fives and twenties in Northern also. Ireland, in, in yeah. Iraq it was fives and twenty-fives. Um, so basically, once you've done that initial five, there's nothing that I can see around here that's a threat. Then the guys get out and do a walk around that five, physically check the five, make sure there's nothing that they're not happy with. And then if we think we're going to be in that particular location for a while, we'll then extend it out to do a full 25 check. So we've we sort of done that. Uh, and I'm talking to uh, the guy that sort of identified himself as the incident commander at the time, and he's given me a brief on what's going on. And, and in front of me, basically, there's a, uh, in, within, the confines of what you can see in the dark is a scene of devastation and lots of glow sticks. And basically what they've done is they've gone around and marked all the body parts and hazardous items such as ammunition, grenades, etc., with these glow sticks. So it's quite a surreal scene uh, in front of me at the time. What would, would often happen at, at scenes is once we've got the information we need, uh, I've got one of my team acting as a scribe, which was, was Drew Martin, the Aussie. Um, I would have basically said, right, this is what we're going to do, guys. This is the plan. We're going to get in, exploit the scene, gather what we need, whether that be samples from the seat of the explosion, like the crater, because if we gather samples there, chemical analysis can give us an idea of what was used, what type of explosive, etc. Maybe if we identify any fragments and like we collect those up as well. All depends on the job itself. So you asked the guys to stay yeah. behind in, in the safe area yeah. and you went forward by yourself? I ended up doing a one-man walk down, which is kind of how normally in Northern Ireland we would, would never all go in as a team. That was just something that had developed in Iraq, really. So I, I, I did this one-man walk around. I've gone down the right-hand side, big crater in the middle of the road. But what I was really concerned about was that sort of verges down both sides of the road, uh, where it'd be easy to conceal something, particularly an antenna for a receiver or something like that. 
uh, and I was using a, just a combination really of white light, night vision equipment, etc. Um, and doing a, a careful, slow walk around. And I was on my way back towards the hard top um, when just everything went into slow motion. Um, and I knew instantly when my left foot touched the ground that it wasn't right. And that was just followed by this massive ex explosion. Feeling being thrown through the air, just really fast, hard wind, hot, punching past me. Um, and being thrown, eventually landing. You, know, you see films where it goes into slow motion. Um, clearly it doesn't, but I think actually when your body and your mind suddenly finds itself in a situation like that, I don't know, maybe it switches to a different mode where it just processes everything so much faster that it seems like it's happening mm. in slow motion. Yeah. And it's one of those moments where, you know, you can uh, once again replay it in your mind a hundred times and, you know, where were you or how, how did you react? Well, in this case, uh, the ID functioned and it knocked all of us to the ground. That's how close we were to this because, remember, we were standing near a Humvee, you know, and, and Pete was uh, within uh, a visual distance of us. And it was a night job. So, you know, now it's, it's like, now what do you do? Right? Uh, that's where your training once again kicks back in and you have to react. And so there was obviously some smoke. It was obviously dark. And, uh, you know, it was milliseconds after that uh, that, you know, Chris called out, you know, hey, Pete, are you, are you good? We didn't hear anything. Uh, and so as Chris started forward, I moved forward with him. I think I landed head first, but thank God my helmet on and obviously had got the wind enormously knocked out of me. Um, and I think probably could have easily died if I'd just relaxed. Um, but I was on the deck there and I thought about my kids, my boys, and getting back home to them. Probably seen too many war films over the years, but the, the only thing that came to mind then was just to shout out loud, medic. Um, really just to let him know where I was. So, you know, he's not where he was. Where is he? And that's one of those moments where you're starting to scan. You know, it's once again, it's dark and smoky and, and things. I could hear him very close by and he, he flew in the air probably about 20 something feet away from the, from the secondary blast. So I went directly to that, that site. And uh, once again, uh, having done this type of work for for a long, long time, and also having been on the uh, firefighter with uh, our Royal Metro Fire Department, you know, having seen many trauma scenes and reacted as a medical responder, you know, I've, you know, you've seen it all until you haven't, right? Well, in this case, it was quite unique for me personally because now it's my guy. It's always been somebody else, but today it was my guy that was injured, right? And in those was moments, you know, there's my uh, TL, my team leader. Uh, it, it, it's horrific, traumatic injuries. Uh, his one leg was gone, his arm was mangled, he's bleeding out, you know, and he's still, you know, lucid, he's, you know, giving us, you know, still commands. It's, you know, fascinating on his part that he had uh, the, the abilities to continue that. So it was one of those moments where, you know, where were you? You know, there you are, right? Uh, and personally, I paused for a second, got it, you know, so I was tending to Pete's wounds and uh, with like a pressure dressing there on my heels, uh, shortly right behind me was my partner, uh, Nick Bushiers. You know, and once again, he had the same medical training I did, you know, prior to coming in the Bureau. So he kicked into action, right? He was in his, his normal battle kit, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, which had sustained some uh, damage due to the explosion. And so, uh, you know, his rifle had been knocked from him a little bit a ways away. And so, you know, we had to quickly assess uh, that situation. Uh, so I called for a medic and meanwhile applied a tourniquet to his leg, uh, which was obviously amputated, and then started trying to address his other wounds. Uh, while that was happening, uh, of note, you know, Pete displayed a tremendous amount of what I would call grit. Uh, during that situation and that uh, Chris was doing his best to keep him conscious and to get information. But 
Pete was freely offering information and trying to make sure that uh, we understood what he knew up to the point of the incident happening. And so it was one of those situations, uh, you know, hindsight being what it is and reflecting back on it, it's almost like a movie um, because he was very calm in a situation where he could have had every right uh, to lose his composure, lose his bearing, but he stayed professional uh, throughout the whole ordeal, even as he was coming in and out of consciousness. They call him Perfect Pete, you know, in the, in the British uh, uh, community, bomb community. And there's a reason for that, you know. He was still giving us commands about uh, the area he was walking, where he went, where he didn't go, stay away from this area, police his, his weapon, find his, his, his ammo, don't leave it behind, all those things that you would, that you would say. Where it's interesting, um, you know, as we're tending to Pete's wounds and we're stabilizing his injury, so I want to make sure he doesn't go into shock, you know, I told, said, Pete, your leg's broken, you know, it's gone, right? However, I don't know if he was aware of that at that moment. I just told him it was broken just for the moment. At the same time, you know, just give him a little peace of mind. I said, and everything else is where it should be. All right. So that laid that out too, because you know everything was below the waist. You know, his, his injury of his leg. So I want to make sure he knew everything else was was good to go. So we'll just say that. Nick and Chris basically got to me first, uh, from from my recollection, um, uh, and got down next to me, um, and basically just. Very lucky that both of them, from their previous military background and other jobs that they had done, were essentially paramedic yeah. trained. Um, so they, they basically got to work to me. They had um, tourniquet, combat application tourniquet with them, so they, they applied that to my leg. Um, I was uh, attempting at the time, not I could, couldn't really see much, but um, attempting to get, I had a morphine injection. Uh, in my pouches, yeah. um, which all the Brits carried, but actually it turned out none of the Americans had. Uh, yeah. It was something that they weren't aware of as well. Um, so I'm actually trying to get this thing yes. out with my left hand. Little did I know that actually my left hand probably wasn't in any sort of condition at all to do anything. But I was like, why can't I get this open sort of thing? Um, eventually gave up on that. Uh, I, I think they managed to, to find it, but then they didn't know how to use it yeah. anyway. Well, I've never monkeyed with this kit before. So I'm trying to figure out how to use it, you know, and this poor guy's in the worst pain of his life. And now I'm monkeying around with this kit and I broke it. You know, I broke his kit, right? So now I can't give him the morphine that he really needs. I mean, we laugh about it now. Yeah, but at the moment, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, I, I just wrecked it. So there's that. All right, so that, that was just an interesting <laughs> kind of a moment. Um, which uh, after that never happened again. We got we trained up on the on the British kits, so we knew what to do in the future. So when the medic arrived, the medic, I I don't know, but I would I would say that the medic was a bit taken aback uh, by the seriousness of Pete's injuries, and when he went to try to start an IV, uh, he was visibly shaking, and it was Pete who actually was like. Hey, it's going to be okay. You got this made. You know, I mean, you know, very, very, again, displaying a lot of grit uh, in a situation that, you know, I, I think others would have folded. Both Chris and Nick had started out their careers as firefighters, so were trained paramedics. Pete believes this saved his life. And despite his injuries and the pain he was in, Pete also saved theirs. It comes back to this whole, you know, not happy about this place. Anyway, and clearly I've just been proven right. Um, th there's one that's just got me. There's probably, or at least one, maybe, or, or two or three more. Uh, and what I didn't want, the worst thing that would have, for me at that point, would for them to then start wandering about and get hit on the way down. You know, there's no nothing I could do about controlling them when they rushed to me to give first aid. But now that they're there, so, you know, it was, it was essentially instructing them, don't go anywhere. I think there's more. But I can't help but back up and, and focus on the, the, the abilities Pete had where he was giving us orders, his commands. As he was keeping us tight, there's another reason for that, right? That, that was part of the training, part of his experience. And once again, you know, we're focusing on him. We're kind of running around making sure we're squaring him away. But at the same time, we're listening to him, whereas we are staying close. 
well, they're there, they're, they're treating me, they're, they're reassuring me, telling me, you know, that I'm going to be all right, that I haven't lost my bits and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I'm sort of more concerned really about, the, you know, their safety because I don't want them to step outside this immediate area where I'm, I'm almost convinced that there's more devices. So once they've sort of got me to the point where they're happy that they've stabilised me, they've, they've got their tourniquet on, um, when they get a stretcher to me, then they, they take me back to the ICP. Um, we're waiting for the, the Black Hawk to come in. They've obviously already called in the, the uh, paramedic helicopter to come in. And they're continuing to reassure me and say that they'll you know, let the wife know I'm okay. Um, but I, I'm still now convinced that you know, we need to make sure that nobody else goes in tonight. There's, there's more down there. It needs, rather than a, an intelligence clear out, it needs an EOD team to go in there. So before they put me on the helicopter, I get them to promise to me that nobody else is going to go in there tonight, that they'll hold the ground and, and get EOD team in tomorrow, which I understand they subsequently did. So in a nutshell, you know, it was, it was uh, harrowing, chaotic, terrifying. Uh, at the same time, um, it was inspiring in the fact of Pete's, uh, his leadership, his behavior that he demonstrated on that scene. And uh, some people will say, yeah, you guys saved him. No, he saved us. He did. Through his actions, through his leadership and his uh, gut feeling, uh, he kept us uh, in a position we could go home to our families. What we didn't know was about 12 feet away was not another secondary, but a tertiary, a third improvised explosive device that was buried in that location. Once again, that's a TTP that the insurgents would use. Very effective. But from Pete's actions, he kept us close. Had we gone down there on the first walk, we, we all could have been taken out. Had he not kept us close on, that, on our response to him, we would have been taken out, it's my, in my opinion. So what made Pete think there might be more than one IED? It's something that's always puzzled Rigo. My question for Pete is, you know, was that a gut feeling uh, that he had? Because sometimes in our craft, we rely on that. And you can call it what you want. You can call it a gut feeling. You can call it a sixth sense. Some people might call it an angel on their shoulders, a little voice, woman's intuition. Depends on how you, how you couch it. But I've always w wondered for Pete if that kicked in on for him to keep us back by the Humvee. Well, he did this, the, the first check, you know, after the area was even cleared. I've got to be honest, that whole day, even before the incident came in, there was some, I'm not a believer in paranormal or anything like that, but that whole day, just within me, it felt like something was going to happen that day. Mm. And I had that feeling all the way up to the deployment and then on the ground particularly. Yeah, I, I told the guys for quite a while afterwards that no, 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 they didn't, they didn't have anything, but I did. It, it, something wasn't right without a doubt. So I, I, that's why I ended up doing this. I guess you get evacuated and you don't see Nick or probably anyone else for quite some time, you know, you go in. I remember um, being put onto the, the helicopter, um, sort of, you know, looking up and just seeing the, the roof inside this Black Hawk and, and people start um, leaning over me and trying to put stuff into me and that's really my last memory. Although I mean, uh, was informed that I was conscious all the way to central Baghdad to the combat support hospital and onto the table. Um, but that's where they basically put me into uh, an induced coma. Um, did all that sort of life-saving surgery and then basically left me overnight to see whether or not I'd die or, or survive. As we all know by now, Pete Norton is made of strong stuff. He made it through the night and was flown out to Ramstein in Germany to the US medical facility. After a few days there, he was moved back to Birmingham's Selly Oak Hospital. So, you know, I lost my left leg above the knee. Uh, my left uh, arm had basically got amputated just below the elbow. Um, I lost 80% of the right buttock, all of the right hamstring, uh, most of my sciatic nerve on the right, nothing worked below the knee, uh, fractured ribs, fractured vertebra, collapsed lungs. Uh, so it, I wasn't. So there's a lot going on that's, yeah. that's, that's not visible as well. Oh yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Um, so I was in Sally Oak Hospital for almost a year um, before they then moved me down to Headley Court, which is our medical rehab facility mm. at the time down in near Leatherhead. Yeah. Uh, and I've been down there for uh, a number of months 
um, starting that whole sort of rehab process. Yeah. And I guess everything you're doing in that rehab facility is quite energetic. You know, you're, yeah. you're trying to um, yeah. learn new ways to move around and yeah. um, deal with... Or just, just to, to move things. Yeah. You know, uh, and having been in the hospital for so long with limited mobility, I mean, I, I think it was uh, more than three months before we managed to get out of the bed, um, nearly six months before I was out of the bed for the first time. So not ideal. I'd been there for a few months and it was almost like being cut off Certainly at Selly Oak and even to a degree, because actually if you think back even to 2005, all the smartphones that we've got now, the email on demand, it wasn't there. Mm. Um, so actually it was almost like being cut off from your friends, society and colleagues, um, putting into our isolation for a period which was quite strange to adapt to um, with no contact. Um, but eventually, um, yeah, I got some two surprise visitors at Headley Court and, and Nick and Rigo were there. There was no hesitation when we had an opportunity to visit Pete when he was at Headley Court uh, shortly after we departed theater uh, to see how he was coming along. And then uh, from that point forward, we just stayed in touch and uh, made sure that he was getting what he needed and just making sure that he knew he wasn't alone. And, uh, you know, back to that grit, his resiliency is also something that is just extremely admirable. Uh, to go through all of the surgeries that he's gone through and all of the associated uh, dynamics and impact that takes place on the family, uh, it's, it's impressive. And he, every time, comes through it uh, at a level that is beyond <laughs> comprehension. Nick and Rigo weren't the only ones to be impressed by Pete. The army was too and told him he was going to be awarded the George Cross. Uh, so that was when I was still in, in Selly Oak uh, in March 2006, and a, a colonel from MOD main building came along, uh, who I didn't know, and basically said, look, we don't normally do this because it's, it's normally uh, released on the day, but because of your situation, you're still in the hospital, we're going to give you sort of as it were, a sneak preview, uh, and you're going to be awarded the George Cross. Which, which happened me like a sledgehammer um, because uh, I, was, I was fully aware of what the award was. Um, former colleagues of mine have, have received them in the past and ammunition technicians and ATOs in the past have, have received them. Um, so I'm, I'm fully aware of its standing and what it means. Um, so yeah, it, was, it, it hit me big. The British Army is very thorough. They really are. I'm, I'm impressed with their processes and stuff. And, and there was an, they, they did an inquiry you know, into the event uh, that uh, we all participated in. We were interviewed, you know, by the British uh, 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 investigators, you know, on, on to the what happened. And, and, and there's a follow-on uh, later, which is to be expected. Um, one of the commanders, uh, Colonel Seddon, uh, asked if I would be willing to write a letter, you know, uh, a written letter uh, for the Board of Inquiry. You know, I said, absolutely. It would be my pleasure to do that. So, yeah, I wrote this letter. And I asked my unit chief, you know, hey, send this on to, the, to the, the Brits. Do I send it to the embassy and have them walk it over? Whatever. And, you know, my boss said, nope, send it right to the colonel, you know, direct. So, point, send it. And, and, and that, you know, is this going to be part of this package? So the interesting thing was, I don't know, it was about a month and a half later, the colonel calls me back. says, he says, Rigo, uh, you know, thanks for the drafting the letter. Everything's good to go. With, with the inquiry, no, no issues. Um, Pete's doing great. He's in you know, the hospital. He had, he's had you know, multiple surgeries. Um, and he, he advised uh, that he was going to be awarded the George Cross, which is absolutely amazing, you know. And uh, it was kind of funny how the colonel put it. He goes, yeah, your, your letter was part of that package. And, to the, and actually, it was read by the queen herself. I was like, okay. So to my guys and my squad, I remind them, you know, be careful what you write. You never know who's going to read it. So what did Pete's family and friends think at the time? Obviously, um, everybody was, was, you know, supportive and surprised and certainly from a trade perspective, proud, I guess. Mm. Um, it wasn't the best of times, uh, sort of that point onwards, really, family-wise. Um, unfortunately, a year in hospital, um, after you know three four months on ops, followed by a year in 
um, rehab and all the issues that go with that uh, resulted in a breakdown of the marriage. Um, it was just too much and unfortunately the army didn't really help. They didn't do as good a job as they could have in supporting the family and, and relieving the stresses that they were under. I'm not sure they even recognised it. So unfortunately that was not a good time uh, life-wise. So when I, when I eventually left rehab, uh, I, I didn't end up going back to a, a family. I ended up coming here to Shrivenham into a single room to start a master's course. Right. So your life changed in, in a lot of ways. Massively. Really. Yeah. And I guess emotionally yeah. that must have taken yeah, huge. its toll as yeah. well. And that, and that slowed the whole recovery down to be honest. It's complicated yeah. everything. I guess, you, you know, I mean, you say you came here to do a master's. Is that a way for you to put your mind into something? Uh, it, it provided that. I mean, it wasn't the reason. I actually got blown up three you, weeks before yeah. I was due to leave and come here and, and do that master's anyway. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully the, the MOD kept the place open for me. Um, so when I eventually did return uh, from rehab, uh, I was able to go straight into that and, and get on with that. Um, so that, that sort of provided me with a focus whilst trying to deal with all the other things yeah. that were going on in life at the time as well. And uh, I guess you went to Buckingham Palace. Is, was it a Buckingham Palace? Uh, it was. Um, slightly un, unusual, to be honest. Uh, so normally um, something like the George Cross and the Victoria Cross uh, you would get presented by Her Majesty the Queen. Um, but I don't know if you can cast your mind back to 2006, late 2006. And it's one of the very few times during her reign when Her Majesty has had to stop doing duties. Oh, really? um, she had a, a, a bad back, okay. um, which must have been bad for her to stop yeah, well, doing <laughs> duties. Um, but I, I, I'm going to say I bet it was not her decision. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but the whole thing, the whole investiture uh, had already been sort of booked up. I'd already accepted the dates. We got lunches booked for people and the whole thing. I was still at Headley Court at the time. I actually got a call the day before from the palace. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure not many people get calls like this. And, you know, Her Majesty sends apologies, but she's not going to be able to do the investiture tomorrow. Would you like to reschedule? Um, I had a quick think on my feet and was like, oh, I've got so much organised. Other, <laughs> other people booked, you know, coaches, dinners in uh, Regent's Park, barracks and all that. It's like, you know what, I can't, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to continue. So I think I'm probably the only person who's had a George Cross presented by Princess Anne. Uh, and she at the time said, you know, this, I never get to give these out. Um, and it was quite nice in, in some respects, as, as much as a disappointment as it was not to have it presented by Her Majesty. At least Princess Anne was our colonel in chief. Mm. I'd met her on a, a couple of occasions, so it was it was quite special in that respect yeah. as well. Uh, and the palace were fantastic. But it wasn't the only honour Pete received. One of my counterparts, uh, one of the special agent bomb technicians who knew Pete, who was in Iraq, uh, he made the suggestion. Uh, he's like, "Hey, uh, uh, why don't you put Pete in for the FBI star?" I'm like, that's usually for only for FBI agents. It's kind of like a Purple Heart for FBI agents. It's only, only agents have received it at that moment. He goes, yeah, but he's part of your team. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. So I kind of had the letter written earlier, the one I sent for the inquiry. I, you know, I, I, I just kind of retooled it a little bit and I sent it to FBI Director Mueller at the time, you know, for consideration. You know, once again, he's a foreign national. He's not an on-duty FBI agent. And it was, it was pretty awesome. Uh, it came back, they went, absolutely, he's going to get that. And I think uh, he, he's not one of the first, if not in conjunction with another uh, uh, foreign national that got the FBI star first ones in, in our history. It's pretty neat. Uh, so the FBI star is uh, awarded for actions which result in uh, serious injury uh, and you know that's typically in the course of a hostile action and so given that we were in a team environment and given that our team was responsible for conducting what i think could be best described as rule of law operations uh, in addition to force protection uh, you know when my my colleague Chris was like, "Hey, what what do you think about this?" I said, "You know, that is fantastic. It, that is a terrific idea, and he's most deserving of it." Yeah, that was a weird one. That was a, a few years 
afterwards, actually, and I, I, I think it was 2010 off the top of my head, I, I can't remember exactly now. Uh, so I'd finished my master's degree um, and I'd stayed on as a directing staff and lecturer at Shrivenham at the Defence Academy. Uh, and I was in the office and I got a phone call and it was like, hi, I'm from the FBI. I was like, oh, you don't get these calls every day. Uh, and we'd like to give you an award. Can you know? Could you come over on this date? Uh, and unfortunately, the first thing I had to say is, I don't know, actually, because um, I've got to get approval from main building. So they, they literally phoned me up directly. Um, so they hadn't come via the MOD? No, I hadn't gone through the MOD or anything. <laughs> so, so I said, look, let, let me call you back. Um, and I phoned up uh, the MOD uh, desk at Honours because um, having already sort of got the George Cross by then, I got them on speed dial pretty much. Yeah. Um, and I, I phoned up and said, look, I've just had a phone call from the FBI. They want to give me an FBI star and go over there to an official award ceremony. Uh, you okay with this? Um, and the, the female major at the other end went, no, you're not allowed to. It's not. I says, Hold on a second. You want me to turn around to the FBI <laughs> and say, no, thanks. I'm not. You can stick your award. She went, yeah, you can't. I said, I'll tell you what, you and me never had this phone call. I'm off to, <laughs> to, <the> States. <laughs> I'm off to the States. Um, so, yeah, she, she basically went, yeah, we never had this phone call. Um, so I phoned them back and said, yeah, and give us the dates. Um, I do have a little uh, video to show you, which uh, we, we like to drop this on everyone. So I'm just going to key it up and then you get to see an amazing FBI setup. <laughs> Hola. Can you see that all right? Yeah. It's quite loud, so you shouldn't hear okay. it. Yeah, so, you know, obviously when you're in combat, which is kind of hard to describe unless you've been there, uh, you do form a bond. Uh, even with individuals that you may not necessarily associate with on a non-combat uh, basis. So there's definitely uh, a bit of uh, of a brotherhood in that respect. Uh, we're uh, way past that. Uh, it's not a friendship. It's a brotherhood, and that's something that uh, that you endure together. And we have become family. I see we, uh, Pete, Nick, and I have the three of us have become very close over the years, um, sharing uh, personal events, family events. The biggest thing I can say to Pete is thank you. And I would not be where I am now. I would not have the family that I have now uh, if it wasn't for Pete and for his grit and, again, uh, just being himself. And so that is something that will always, always resonate with me. But the message, I guess I would say, is, you know, I want to thank you, Pete. Uh, yeah, you saved our lives on the... On the that, that uh, horrific day, and you know, our families are uh, in, in gratitude to you as well. So it's our pleasure to uh, be now related to you because <laughs> you're stuck with us. All right, that's, that's my message. Brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to drop that on you. Um, that is um, Rigo and Nick, yep. um, two of your FBI colleagues, who you're now really close friends you know as they say family family yeah um and you uh, godfathers to my daughters mm. yeah. they're, they're great guys i could not have wished for any better people yeah to work with without um them. we've had some stories um <laughs> but the fbi they, they play it all straight officially but um yeah they, they can be a bit naughty actually yeah and so can pete rigo had told me a story about when he took pete to a halloween party in the u.s Whilst I was here doing my masters, um, I met, uh, I, I sort of got divorced, uh, and I met uh, a, a wonderful girl called Kate who was doing her PhD. Uh, and basically, we fell in love and, and got married in 2013, which is why well, we now, ha now have two young daughters. Um, but the two of us uh, were over in the States uh, visiting the guys, and it was around Halloween time, so that they invited us along to one of their colleagues' Halloween parties. And, and the Americans do these big Halloween parties. Yeah. Well, here's Pete's crazy sense of humor and his wife, Kate. They're two peas in the pot. Uh, Pete uh, was going to go as a zombie patient, okay? His wife is going to be the zombie doctor. So imagine they got the whole zombie persona going on, right? Well, Pete uh, used his, his limbs or lack of limbs as part of his costume 
including you know, like like uh, uh, bloody stumps and 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 cut off pants and stuff like that. He absolutely, you know, took it to the next level. And if, and Kate, as the doctor, you know, she's all you know geared up the same way. They, they looked awesome. The pictures are great. A couple of years ago, Pete had his right leg amputated above the knee. Originally, I wanted them to get rid of the right leg, but they, they wouldn't do it. Um, they just wanted to save as much as they could. Um, so I ended up living sort of in a wheelchair and, and with that right leg uh, holding me back in many respects because it's, it's practically a dead weight, uh, holding that for some, what, 14, 15 years. Um, and then in 2019, after what was actually a long battle against the system, particularly the NHS, um, but the uh, part of an MOD and NHS trial, I flew out to Sydney in Australia, uh, had my right leg amputated above the knee. Uh, and in the same operation, two titanium rods inserted, one up into each femur, which are basically just always stick out the end of, of my legs now. Uh, and then I can attach prosthetic knees directly. Right. Is that, was that new? Is that why that was? It's a relatively new thing. It's been around for a number of times, but it's not widespread. It's certainly not available directly on the NHS at the moment, right. although hopefully it, it will be. But basically it means that um, I can now, I, I am in the middle of learning to walk on so that microprocessor knees. Your, your decision and your fighting yes. to get it done yep. is, has allowed you then to take, move on to the next step, which was holding you, it was holding you yeah, back. So uh, earlier this year, January, I, I took uh, receipt of my, my new knees, as it were, and had them fitted and everything set up. And I've had a, a couple of rehab sessions, typically about three weeks at a time now. I put the Defence Medical Rehab at the new one at Stanford mm -hmm. Hall, where I've now successfully been able to walk several hundred metres, um, uh, some of it using just a stick at the moment, uh, still on relatively flat, yeah. even services. Like you say, it's been a lot of years, so you've it got is, a lot and of I've got to build up core strength and learn. You know, a lot of muscle memory's been lost. Um, so that, that's an ongoing thing at the moment. Uh, keeping busy with, with work, uh, running my own consultancy for a few things, uh, and just um, passed an interview and been accepted to do a PhD here at Cranfield. An extract from Pete Norton's citation reads, before allowing them to render first aid, he instructed his team on which areas were safe and where they could move. Despite having sustained grievous injuries, he remained in command and coolly directed the follow-up actions. It is typical of the man that he ignored his injuries and regarded the safety of his men as paramount as they administered life-saving first aid to him. It is of note that a further device was discovered less than 10 metres away and rendered safe the following day. Captain Norton's forthright and clear orders in the most difficult of circumstances, undoubtedly prevented further serious injury or loss of life. 